Welcome to the Jackson Perkins webinar on new roses and plants for 2023. This is exciting to introduce these to you, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to use them. And joining me is my other half at Jackson Perkins, Wes Harville, who is a brand director for JP. Wes, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning. Uh, this is exciting times. I know it's the dead of winter, but we all want to talk about new things for spring. It is, I know. It's a, We hit New Year's Eve, January comes around, and everybody starts opening up. In fact, my Jackson Perkins catalog arrived yesterday, and I'm already going through it, knowing, figuring out what I'm going to hit you up for. And uh, so we're off and running. So we've got some exciting new roses. Let's jump right in. Um, first one, Wes, never been redder. This is a phenomenal rose. Tell me about it. You know, what class of bit, what, how big does it get? You know, just talk about what, what you love about this rose. I hate to pick a favorite when there's so many choices, but this may be one of my favorites. Um, I've seen it around the country. It blooms like crazy. It's a floribunda. Not only does it bloom, but it's big, bright, and red. Uh, nice size blooms in the spring and fall, up to four inches, lots of petals. It just has everything that you're looking for. And on top of that, it is relatively compact, about four foot tall and three foot wide. Yeah, which is a great landscape use. And I bring this up, too, that, you know, we have our, our uh, you know, genetics block down at LSU Ag Center in, uh, in Baton Rouge. And this is one of their favorites. And even in the, uh, the Baton Rouge, Louisiana sun in the summertime, the color doesn't fade on this one, which is really unique for a red. Yeah, and my experience is seeing it down there is that it, it slowed its bloom cycle in the summer, but it did continue to bloom in the summer under really, really wet conditions that they've been dealing with this year. Yeah, I've got three of these in my garden that I got from you a couple of years ago as an advanced preview. And they, they stand out, first of all. I mean, you can probably see them from the space shuttle if you really wanted to. Um, but uh, it's an outstanding rose and great color. And, and, and so we got some perennials, too, that are new as well at Jackson Perkins. And we wanted to pair a couple of these up and sort of talk about it a little bit. And, and if I may jump in here, um, you see at the top right-hand corner, that's a Veronica Vernique Blue. That's new to us. And uh, Crocus Mia, which I probably just butchered the name of that, but Firestarter. And the blue and the red is a classic pairing. Blue goes with any rose. Why? Because there's no real blue roses. And then um, the Crocus Mia, it's a daring pairing with that bright orange with the slightly red tinting on the side. But that's a nice pairing with those colors, I think. Yeah, and it's uh, we have this as a grafted bush, and we have it in a 24-inch uh, patio tree also. Which would be nice. I mean, I could see that Veronica getting about 12 inches high, like underneath the patio tree at the base of the patio to sort of hide the base a little bit, but still identify it being a patio. But those colors will work really well together. Really nice rose, never been redder, just a terrific, terrific floribunda. And on to the next one, introducing Peppermint Party. And I'm going to call this Peppermint Patty by mistake several times. I'd like to apologize right now. <laughs> Let's tell us about Peppermint Party. Peppermint Party for you, Rosarian's got a little uh, Betty Boop blood in her. Uh, she is a multicolor uh, with a bright uh, pink edge, and the pink will red, the center will yellow. It just has a group of colors that it phases through throughout the bloom cycle, and it comes in colors. We have this as a grafted bush. The blooms are up to three inches. It has a moderately fruity flavor our fruity uh, fragrance, and it gets eight to 10 foot in the garden. Yeah, so it's a great climber is what it is. And again, I've got this one as well. And one thing I really noticed with Peppermint Party is that the blooms stay on the climbing canes, the climbing plant very long. I mean, the blooms, I've had blooms last, you know, a week to 10 days and look every bit as fresh. Well, I've seen it around the country and especially in Southern California, it just has that red tipping to pink tipping and the center is not bright yellow but creamy yellow all the way to the pink center that you see here so it's changing all the time yeah and there's so many things it can go with as well you know we have a veronica again at the top right hand corner this is a raspberry new to us you can see the raspberry dancing off the edges of the petals there and then Phlox opening that romance that that again that classic kind of almost bluish purplish pairing with these would really set it off well. And and flocks, by the way, are good for butterflies and pollinators. So if you've got, you know, if you're looking towards getting into that kind of thing in your garden, think about flocks. They really well. And this particular one, repeat blooms, which I love about it as well. So peppermint party, outstanding new climber. I can verify personally growing this in my nose spray garden in the upstate of South Carolina. It's a really, really wonderful, wonderful climbing rose. And it'll bloom that first year. 
Yeah, yeah, mine did actually. Even when the climber is only about three feet high and growing, I already had flowers on it. And uh, but now it's starting to put out its climbing canes in its second and third year, which is normal for climbers, by the way. You know, sleep, creep, leap takes about three years to establish, but just a great rose and, and just a great pairing with all kinds of stuff. And we'll talk about another pairing with climbing roses in a little bit, and that's a teaser. Uh, let's move on and blushing lavender, lovely color. Everybody loves this color. Uh, Wes, tell us about this beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, when we saw this in research, we had to introduce it. This is the tradition of Jackson Perkins, big, beautiful blooms. This is a grand of flora. The thing I like about it is it's very soft in its color, but it has those ruffled petals. It has uh, nice, big blooms that you're used to with Jackson Perkins introductions, up to 50 petals. But even with all the big that I'm talking about, it's still only going to be about four to five feet tall and two to three foot wide which is a very nice manageable size for any garden. And uh, and again, we've prepared it with some perennials. And again, this being more of that mauvish kind of color, this rose is going to go with just about anything. There's almost nothing it won't go with. Um, but we just cut a new agastache, which I love agastaches. This is agastache sunrise. Um, agastache pollinators and hummingbirds and butterflies adore agastache. Again, another great reason to have this in your garden. That's also going to bring in beneficial insects. Agastache will come after that. And this is available in a tree rose, which is really, really nice, or a standard or tree rose, whatever you call it. And tree roses do well in pots. And I can see this in a pot underplanted with one of our new thymes, thymus purple carpet, which is a creeping thyme that stays low that you actually let it drape over the sides of the pot. Um, but like you said, Wes, classic JP and a uh, beautiful, beautiful color as well. If you'll notice, too, in the literature when you go online, because these are available for sale now, uh, they, they spiral open, which is not unique, but it's interesting and beautiful. And we went back and forth on this variety because not only does it bloom in small clusters, but almost half the time it will bloom as, as a single bush, which or single blooming, single stem, which makes it kind of questionable between a hybrid tea and grandiflora. But we went ahead with the grandiflora, but it does have that unique blooming style. That makes it great for cutting, too, that you can get that nice single stem with that big old flower. That'll look really nice to bring that in the house when you can even pair it with some stalks or some of the perennials we've been talking about. Absolutely. So we've got one more to introduce, and this is Mandarin Sunset, which is also in my garden. Beautiful colors. Wes, tell us about this, uh, this gorgeous thing. Well, this is kind of a new path for Jackson and Perkins, and I'm not saying we haven't had floribundas in the past, but this is an, uh, a push towards a more a disease resistant landscape variety plant. As you can see, it's super bright. It's a floribunda. It's perfect for mass plantings, borders, and pots. Uh, it has blooms that are traditionally in the floribunda range up to about three inches, a slight fragrance, 15 to 25 petals, and again, relatively compact form. Yeah, this is a really nice plant. I mean, I could see this definitely, you know, it, it, this could anchor a hot border, for example. I mean, you could put this with Never Been Redder. You can throw in that Crocus Mia fire starter that we talked about earlier as well and really get some heat going. And we have a new peony called Lorelei, which is really lovely. This is a cold hardy peony, folks, by the way. Uh, hardy down to, I think, zone four, as a matter of fact, which is really nice for a peony. And peonies and roses are classic pairings. Um, if you do look at gardens in, the, in England, for example, you'll see peonies everywhere. And then Monarda, which is a wonderful plant for butterflies, very important plant for them. That's kind of a kind of a purplish that sets that orange off. That would just make that orange just absolutely pop. So really a lovely color, great durability, landscape plant. Wonderful, wonderful plant, Wes. Well, you know, it's uh, hard to focus on foliage when the blooms are so beautiful, but it, the foliage on this is bright and dark green, and it really makes it pop. And don't be afraid to plant a lot of these in a mass planting because it can really make an impact. And that's a great tip, actually, Wes, about mass planting. Some, whereas Rosarians were always tempted to plant one of this and one of that. But if you can take something like this and plant three or four of them and plant them, not so they crowd each other out, but so that they kind of look like one plant, it really can become a beautiful effect. It's a lovely, lovely rose. And we'd like to move down to just, um, so we have new perennials. Jackson Perkins, of course, is known for roses. But, you know, Wes, we're adding more perennials all the time, aren't we? Yeah, so perennials are a very exciting plant. Uh, they give you a lot for a little bit of effort, and they really function well with ro in rose garden. 
Yeah, they do. And they're also a very important thing for beneficial insects. A lot of uh, perennials will bring those in. And we've got some videos on our website that talk about bringing in beneficial insects. We did a webinar on it. So keep in mind, they're not only beautiful, they're also a very useful part of your garden as well. So we've talked about some perennials, but we've got a couple other things that we want to chat about really, really quickly um, in terms of classes of perennials and potentially how to use them in your garden. The first is clematis. Um, you know, Wes and I were talking earlier, and we talked about peppermint party, which is the climber that we have. Clematis and climbing roses, classic, classic, classic pairing. Clematis like their feet in the shade and their, then their heads in the sun, which means they want the roots kind of shaded. So if you plant them at the base of a climbing rose, you've accomplished exactly that. You've shaded the base. And this is a really lovely one, Wes, called Queen of the Climbers Repeat Flowering. And it'll tra trail its way up through that rose. And sometimes when a climber loses some of its lower leaves in the, in the dry part of the summer, this will fill in and uh, make a stunning. Yeah, it's a great pop. It's, it's the clematis. I've got, I've got several clematises in all my climbing roses, and it's just a, a lovely color combination. This is a really neat new one, too, called Queen of the Climbers. Really striking color for a clematis. Really, really pretty. And then we also know that as gardeners, you know, while well, you have roses, you know, which need full sun, and a lot of perennials need full sun, there's also shady areas of your garden. And we'd like to talk a little bit about this. Wes, I'm going to let you talk about the hellebores a little bit, because I know you're fond of them. Yes, I do love hellebores. Uh, they are really unique in that they phase through their bloom cycles in the, in the winter to the late winter and the more uh, moderate climates in the country, and they come in multiple colors. Uh, their foliage is evergreen. Uh, it's the feature during the summer. They do wonderfully and exist well in the shade, so they become a ground cover that gets you know a couple of feet tall and a bloom feature when not many other things are blooming in the garden in, in the late winter or early spring. Yeah, and they do. And like you said, they're, they go more in shade, which is kind of, you have those shady areas in your garden. They're very early flowering. And even when they're not in flower, the foliage is quite striking. And you can put other things amongst them to kind of come off the foliage. So keep in mind hellebores or Lenten rose, as they're also known as. And one other group we'd like to talk about a little bit for shadier areas are the hucaras or coral bells. Um, and I like these a lot because they have the bright foliage in a shady area. You can almost see here you've got a, a purple and a, and a lime and kind of a, a orange kind of color going on. And this is also, Wes, just a really useful, easy care plant. It certainly is an easy care plant. It can do well in a pot. Uh, it, like you said, it takes the, the sun or the shade, but uh, it also can do well if the soil is a little dry. Yeah, they do really well. They're great, great plants. So that sort of introduces some of the plants we've got. They're on our website now, uh, jacksonperkins.com. Check them out. And Wes, I think it will be kind of fun for people to say, you know, we showed some new roses. And I think maybe if you could just spend a couple minutes just talking about what goes into getting those new roses to market. Well, you know, I'm going to start off the best first. And the best is that these roses that we've mentioned today are only available at Jackson Perkins. And what makes that happen is that the research that we do that's ongoing, uh, these varieties take up to eight to 10 years to get to the market. They are, are selected from thousands of seed, seedlings, and they are incredibly unique. These are first time offerings. Uh, this is the first time people will be seeing them and the only place you can get them is on Jackson Perkins. Some of you may have seen Never Been Redder. Uh, last year we entered that as what we call a pre-sale, but it's truly the 2023 new introduction. And I think that's an important thing to turn out. Like you said, these are unique to Jackson Perkins. Jackson Perkins has over 100 years history of introducing new roses to the, to the market. And this continues and will continue, but there's a lot of time that goes into it. Exclusive to Jackson Perkins, jacksonandperkins.com. Wes, thank you very much. As always, fun to talk about roses and plants. It makes me feel like spring's just around the corner. Thank you. You're welcome.